This is Mile High. We have to do it better in order to move people along. Up, down, inside out. If you get your mind right, it is not. It is a receiver of thought. Because love is my first technique. It's now time for the show. Welcome to the Mile High Podcast. This is your host, Dr. Daniel Knowles, coming to you uh, from an altitude of 5,280 feet in Boulder, Colorado. And I want to first thank you for being a listener, viewer, and subscriber. Um, this podcast is on iTunes, Stitcher, Facebook, Google, YouTube, a whole bunch of channels, downloaded in 35 countries. And we want to thank you for continuing to spread the word. Um, if you enjoy these episodes and you're not a subscriber, hit subscribe and join us and never miss an episode. And secondly, share it with someone uh, that loves chiropractic, whether it be a student, a chiropractor, or a chiropractic professional working in an office, so we can help shift and change the tide of the chiropractic profession. And of course, mark your calendar if you have not already to join us at Mile High August 16th to 19th this year, www.milehighchiro.org. We look forward to seeing you there. It's a home for subluxation focused practitioners of all types and uh, you know, going into our sixth year. Today, I am super excited and thrilled to get to spend some time and host this episode with Dr. Deed Harrison. He's the director, he almost needs no introduction. He's a director and owner of Ideal Spinal Health Center. He graduated from Life West Chiropractic College in 96. He's a, absolutely a world-renowned researcher and, and educator in chiropractic. Um, he's published over 100 peer-reviewed journals, which is journal articles, which is just mind-boggling to me. Uh, chair of the PCCRP radiography guidelines, president of chiropractic biophysics, techniques and sem seminars, and he's the president of the CBP nonprofit and a second generation chiropractor. So, um, and I personally feel that the work that yourself and your dad, as well as the whole CBP community has done for chiropractic has, has helped uplift uh, the whole profession and contributes to the knowledge base of the whole profession in, in a very profound way. And I think it needs more acknowledgement than it, than it has received and more, uh, more people learn it and get, get aware of it. So I'm very grateful to spend this time with you today. Thank you for joining us. Oh, you're welcome, Daniel. Thank you for having me on, and uh, that was a, an awesome introduction. It, uh, you know me better than, than I know me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but I, I do know that it's important for chiropractic to uh, develop research and, develop, and optimize our techniques and approaches, and you've been a leader in that, which means a lot to me. Um, so, first of all, we were just talking a little bit, and I just saw your recent paper um, that you published with McCoy Press uh, about radiogenic cancer risk from x-rays. I think that was phenomenal, and um, let's just start off with that topic. Uh, do you feel, tell me about how you feel, uh, and everybody here, um, about the importance of x-rays in chiropractic. Oh man, to to me, I I wouldn't practice without X-ray and chiropractic. Honestly, I, I would not even be a chiropractor. Uh, X-ray gives us the you know the true biomechanical rationale for looking at somebody's spine and deciding whether or not they're within normal limits or if they actually need some care based on what they actually you know show on their radiographic alignment. And, Without x-ray to me, you're just guessing. I mean, it, it's great to palpate. People misunderstand CBP all the time and me. I put my hands on people every day, every time. We're, we're locating areas that are taut and tender and inflamed and, you know, feel like they're fixated. But at the end of the day, that's a clinical guess, right? That's a, that's a clinical judgment. When, when I take an x-ray, it's not a guess whether or not a person has a cervical kyphosis or a straight neck or an S-curve or whether they have a good lordosis. It's a biomechanical fact that we can all verify. So to me, x-ray is the mainstay gold standard of spine assessment in chiropractic. Well, and I, I think it's vital and central to pra practice. It's completely transformed. I thought in school I would never have an X-ray unit. In about 10 years in practice, I, I got one, and it transformed my practice. And I think it's vital to outcome assessments and grateful to utilize it and encourage everybody to do so as well. Um, with that, uh, recently our, our – American Chiropractic Association has put out some position papers and opinions uh, relative to the use of x-ray. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, this issue with the ACA and the choose wisely, you know, guidelines that they put out, 
Uh, I'll, I'll get back to that in a second. The, the problem, it, it dates back like two decades. The, there began a movement about 20 years ago in chiropractic uh, from the research circles and from the top down, which is really the CCE, top down to change chiropractic standards of education and really remove x-ray from you know chiropractic education in the chiropractic colleges and then remove it from license renewal seminars and and then on and on to the, you know insurance guidelines and so like you know Daniel how long have you been a practicing chiropractor 20 years right so y you you and I are we're the old timers now I graduated <laughs> yeah, yeah it's fun I graduated in 1996 well when we went to chiropractic college we x-rayed every new patient that came in the door right yeah, every absolutely. one of them I went to Life West where'd you go I went to Sherman Sherman. So we we actually every actually, we graduated the same year. You and I graduated in '96. Fantastic. Okay. I thought I, you know I I thought I I remember that, but I didn't totally. So I had to ask, right? So we're we're the old guys that people in our generation we X-rayed every single new patient. Yep. It was just it was the way it was. Well, starting in the early 2000s, that began to change. Why all of a sudden is X-ray no good? in the year 2000 but it's great in the 1990s there's got to be something going on and to me I'm, I'm into conspiracy theories and, <laughs> and and I can tell you that my opinion on this and are there hard data facts not really but when you put everything in perspective and somebody like me that travels around the world I, I see and hear everything in chiropractic so I, I think it has to do with follow the money as yeah, soon I as Yep. As soon as you have an evidence-based, true, proven system and proven diagnosis on a patient, you, you cannot refute that it's there on the x-ray. You can refute what it means, but you cannot refute if it's there or not. Right. And then insurance and third-party payers, they don't want to do that. And then managed care organizations that act as the middle agent, their job is, is to save the insurance company money. We all know this as chiropractors. We all know that our care gets cut, our claims get cut, and we know that it's not about the needs of the patient. It's about the bottom line for the managed care organization saving the insurance company. And so if, if they can save X dollars, then they profit X dollars, right? And who gets screwed? Well, the clinician and the patient. So th this is what I think personally happened to chiropractic. It started from the top down. It changed the education. Then it changed the politics, and then it changed the guidelines. And the guidelines were not written for practicing chiropractors. The guidelines were written for managed care organizations. Clearly. And, and we, all, we all know if you try to join, and I'm not going to name the names, but you know it, X managed care organization. Mm -hmm. Well, one of their questions is, do you routinely take x-rays? And what techniques do you practice? They, they don't even want you as part of their organization if you do CBP and if you take x-rays. Why? Because they know they're going to have a fight on their hands, right? So they just kick the doctors out of network who take x-ray and who actually do techniques that use x-ray. And the sole purpose is to squash true evidence-based practice from the clinician because everything else is, oh, it's a guess and it's based on pain and it's based on disability questionnaires, right? So, you know, th this thing with the ACA, the choose wisely, it's just another like, you know, spoke in that wheel, if you will, to try to reinforce their agenda to remove, you know, x-ray and chiropractic. And this time they went to the public. I mean, it's not even a legal document. It's not a peer-reviewed article. It's an ACA position statement on what they think a, a chiropractor should and shouldn't do. And, and the bad thing is they, they scared the public from, you know, true chiropractic, you know, clinicians that would take x-ray and really try to help them and try to do the right thing. And, and clearly the person that ends up being hurt through that is the public because their care is going to get altered. Um, it, that's that's who it hurts the most is people getting lesser quality care. And you know there's a connection with the ACA and the chiropractic educational system because you know in schools many of the schools not all of them not not Sherman for example and not others when you become a student they make you a member of the ACA they give you a, right. you know to to become a member so then you see this as an authority and then this organization is saying don't do this it's going to impact education throughout and then a whole generation of chiropractors. Yep. Yeah, it, the good news with the ACA choose wisely 
they got so much pressure on them and not from somebody like me they could give a crap what i say even though we wrote you know research and that's my side of it i rebut their position and opinion with actual data in fact but organizations like the ICA the the lead chiropractic colleges like Palmer with Chancellor Mark Iori, you know put out a position statement and and then the ACA was actually forced to to retract that temporarily and that came out in Dynamic Chiropractic where they had so much you know fallout from the rest of the profession that they they had to retract that which is a damn good thing right finally you know loud voices and and logic kind of you know superseded for the moment right yep yep well that and that doesn't usually uh take high ground in chiropractic sadly <laughs> yeah that's right yeah <laughs> it should more uh i want to go into more science areas before i do that i would like to let people get to know you a little bit more personally like we have a little bit in common like we graduated the same year two different goes uh we're both second generation chiropractors what was it like growing up as a second generation chiropractor for you oh uh, you, you know <laughs> It, it was really cool. I, I was gifted the opportunity to be involved in this, right? And then it was my choice whether or not to pursue it. But I can tell you it was also hard, like following in you know, my late father's footsteps, so to speak, because he was such a loud voice. You know, you either loved him or you hated him. You, right. you, you, knew, you knew about him because he made, made you aware of him. And you either loved what he did or you hated what he did. And, you know, people looked at me and they wondered what I was going to be and then they when I started you know doing some things they also just kind of assumed that oh it was just handed to me I didn't have to work for it um, just you know riding in on the coattails or following the, in the footsteps so you know th those things created some challenges and struggles but those you know looking back on it that's that was good it made me who I am <clears throat> it gave me a little fortitude to, to work hard and, and establish myself you know, as an individual authority and an expert uh, in CBP, but also just in chiropractic in general. But, it, you know, I had so many amazing opportunities, you know, growing up with people like Dr. Dan Murphy and, and et cetera, you know what I mean? Yeah, so, absolutely. And, and I strongly feel the profession is better for your contributions and want people to, to, to learn more about that. Uh, and, and I can relate to everything you just said. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, so uh, now something else, well, many chiropractors unfortunately don't know this name and this topic, um, but I'm, I'm sure you do. Uh, how important do you feel the work of Alf Bregg is to P chiropractors understanding of subluxation in the spine and the nervous system? Yeah, I think uh, Alf Bregg, the MD, PhD, I think his work is really, the to me, it's the foundation of spine subluxation and nerve interference. To me, it's the most tangible model that we have that shows that alterations in the spine affect the mechanical properties and, and the neurophysiological properties of the central nervous system. So to me, it's it's groundbreaking, pioneering work. And and you know obviously he's deceased now he probably doesn't have any idea or didn't have any idea how impactful his work would be on the chiropractic profession right, right. so and it's it's been the the basis of everything that i kind of do in in a way because of of me reading Alf Bregg's you know books and and articles and i read all three of his books a lot of people don't know he had three textbooks 1960, 1978, and 1989, and then he published probably 16 to 18 peer-reviewed journal articles. Well, I collected them all as a student and read them all, and to me it just was like the spine actually makes a difference to neurophysiology <laughs> and the nervous system, right? Yeah. It's, it, it's biomechanics, so to me that's, that's the foundation of, of chiropractic. Yeah, and I think it's sad that it's not the foundation where people – Graduate as a chiropractor have not been exposed to even the name, let alone the information, and I see that across the board. Uh, I think it should be the foundation of, of the spinal anatomy and physiology that we learn, or a big part of those courses. It changes the picture of understanding subluxation and and uh, so dramatic dramatically. Um, yep. So, uh, is there a normal posture? Yeah, th this is a that, that's a big box right normal yeah. posture well there there's different versions of normal posture and and obviously we know this depending on the task you're doing like sitting right now for me 
there there is an optimum sitting position in in the chair that you're sitting in right so the problem with is there an optimal posture it's it's like environmental dependent right so example if you're walking on a tilted hill well the optimum posture is you will have a short leg and you'll have an uneven pelvis and your rib cage translated over to match that environmental stimuli and then you know when we look at this in chiropractic in, in specifically in, in CBP we go is there an optimal upright standing posture for static equilibrium and then the answer would also be yes there is in that environment in upright standing standing stance we need centers of mass vertically aligned with with respect to the gravitational force right so you, you know you'd have to take each issue and then break it down and go yes there is in every environmental circumstance there is an idealized posture but also realizing here's the thing that I'm sure you know you and I agree on is that the static alignment that's very important that sets the stage for the dynamic movement which is also critically important like how how are we going to move move and interact with this environment postural alignment plays a huge role in those things right so th that's my oversimplified answer <laughs> to a simple question right and well and then from that um can, can that be restored can ideal be restored well certainly it can like you know there there's big movements in you know physical medicine and, and pt and chiropractic to change seated postures and you know you can pursue rehabilitative strategies or you can alter the environment itself like alter the chair alter the workstation and you know that's the field of ergonomics right and so we know that ergonomics is very successful at in improving and altering seated postural environments seated tasks and then in upright standing you know my group has shown that we we certainly can modify somebody's altered posture back towards you know idealized positions and you know do we get them close no we get them back towards it right so th there's there's actually starting to be today a host of you know scientific evidence both case studies clinical trials prospective trials etc showing that we can modify posture and 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 then what is the connection between posture and subluxation yeah this this is a big one like a lot of doctors go well you know why would i look externally at somebody's gross postural alignment of their head of their rib cage and of their pelvis when when I'm just focused on the the inner segmental function of the spine well the reality is they go hand in hand you know the spine is not set up as a segmental system you know you know if we if we look back at muscle physiology and neurophysiology and I say hey Daniel what I want you to do is I want you to move C1 without moving your skull and you know, you know, people sit there and go, what? And I go, yeah, I want you to laterally flex C1 without moving your head relative to your thorax. Well, you can't do it. You're not wired that way. You know, I've actually had people go, oh, I can do it. And then I go, well, okay, I've got video motion x-ray. Let's go find out, right? <laughs> and then, you know, of course, nobody wants to do that. So the reality of it is, you know, mechanically, posture is the influence on the the structure of the spine like the classic example is when you anteriorly translate your head there's a kinematic response where the lower neck flexes and the mid and the upper neck extend so you get this translation forward and then you get this low neck flexion and upper neck extension and it looks like a pseudo s curve on the x-ray well that shows you right there that posture influence the influences the alignment of the spine globally but also segmentally right Yep. So without, without a postural assessment, I don't think you can truly understand what it is that you're looking at on the x-ray. That's brilliant and very important for people to realize and that they're not, that, that you need both. That's uh, right. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, going into the conspiracy theory, uh, we <laughs> talked about x-ray and then we go into the area of subluxation just in general. and. Uh, you know, many camps and different research papers have different varying definitions of subluxation and not necessarily to go there. However, uh, when we when we look at that, uh, we've dealt with that in Colorado is the elimination of subluxation, the elimination of, of that from our practice, sadly, you know, and, and fought that. And there's actually a, a post a, a few years back where I, we had put in some 
position papers that we worked on with the local with the state organization and when you saw those you said you commented i remember it you know there should be nothing less than this of course this is of course the way it should be um right. you know how much do you feel the x-ray area is intertwined with the let's eliminate subluxation from chiropractic area i think it's huge and and you know obviously you know we could spend hours on this topic alone the the issue historically if you look at the 1970s there there started to be this movement to remove alignment of the spine and structure of the spine from subluxation and just solely rely on movement and segmental motion with motion palpation and these things and it's it's not that those techniques are wrong I don't want anybody to misinterpret what I'm saying but historically that's about when it happened in the 1970s chiropractic started changing and to me I think there was two reasons number one not every technique was achieving structural alignment changes so and we all know this as a clinician and, and I don't mean a case study once in a while I mean if I give you a hundred subjects can you change their spine towards normal that's a totally different game than I got a case study right so techniques weren't showing that they were changing the structure of the spine so we had to do something else and something else was we had to you know go to motion because we adjust the joints and we know that it improves mobility maybe it's only temporarily but at least we can quantify the mobility improvement right right and and then came in the managed care organizations and all this stuff where it was you know limitation of of chiropractic care and you know that started happening in the 90s and then now we we are here today removing subluxation well if you only look at functional types of of movement ideas what do we really have in chiropractic to assess well most clinicians use their hands well how do you how do you prove it's there by an independent party if you just use your hands well and then we go well i've got range of motion well the the average clinician out there doesn't even use validated range of motion equipment right they eyeball it right i mean they go oh it looks like it's normal limits well you know that that's not quantification so the the issue is to me i think when alignment got thrown out it it made it possible for for everything to fit and all techniques work and and we get people out of pain and we improve their mobility and that's it and you know how long does that take well the average person responds in 6 to 12 visits right and i don't mean totally gone from pain because it takes a hell of a lot longer than 6 to 12 visits but you see like 40 to 45% improvement in 6 to 12 visits and their pain's down and their movement's better happy day insurance guidelines you know they like it the, the you know anti chiropractic people they like it because we're not claiming that you know subluxation improves a host of whatever we're just saying oh it's for pain and disability and motion right so you know back to the x-ray thing you've got these organizations throwing out x-ray and they'll use two things they'll say oh it's a risk for the patient because of ionizing radiation and then they say it's monetarily driven the chiropractor just wants to make money so I mean these are these are the two attacks that you know are generally used for people that want to take x-ray and so they'll attack you on the monetary side of it and they'll attack you on the the radiation side of it and really it comes down to it's a control issue in the chiropractic profession they want to throw out the whole idea of subluxation assessment that's truly quantifiable right and that we can actually as a profession we can actually all agree on and you know I'll, I'll touch on models of subluxation in a minute but this issue with you know you ask the average chiropractor how much money they make on patient x-rays <laughs> And it's it, it's nothing. I mean, God, you know, maybe I can take my kids out to a meal and go to the go to the arcade game with as much money as I make on X-ray, right? And you know, off the record, but I'm publicly saying this. Most of the time, we give them away because we don't want to. I, I want to tell a person, I'm not trying to make money on taking an X-ray. Here, I'll give it to you for free. I don't care, right? Right. I mean, so how much money do you make in your practice on X-ray? Not much. Not, not much. much. It's not. It's not. It's not. A, I don't see it as my income maker by any no. chance. No. Yeah, no. No. It's an assessment. Right. It's an, but but they'll use that because in medicine, 
X-ray is used and MRI is used and CTs, they're used for the evaluation and medicine charges a shit ton of money for evaluation. Exactly. Right? And chiropractors were exactly opposite. We charge our money based on the intervention, our treatment. Right. And you know, to us, hey, most of us would give our assessments away. And and, right? and a lot of people do. Right. Yeah. Right. So and I'm not I'm not saying that I agree with that. I'm right. just saying that uh, yeah, yeah. that's just the way it is. So so we know the money issue is false. And then the radiation phobia, oh my God, that's such a huge issue. That's radiation phobia is just as big of a problem as is subluxation real or not, right? So people are scared of radiation, and it's so ridiculous, just like people are trying to say there's no such thing as subluxation, which is so ridiculous, right? So, you know, the real issue is what is subluxation and can we agree to it? I don't know if that will ever be you know, answered in chiropractic, but we do have biomechanical models that we can call types of subluxation that are valid and reliable. And those models we can see on imaging. Like, for example, one of them is, what's your sagittal plane curvature? And do you have a kyphotic neck? That's a model of a subluxation. Now, do you want to call it a spine displacement or do you want to call it subluxation? That's the only debate, right? And then, you know, via x-ray, I can prove to you it's there. And then we can debate whether or not we want to just call it a spine displacement or a subluxation. And, and to me, it's such a stupid issue. Let's call it a subluxation. That's what it is, right? Yep, yep. And, and uh, it, it's so interesting to see all this and as – you know, spanning a time frame for you and I, well, I guess it's 22 years in chiropractic, and we've seen the shifts and ebbs and ebb and flow politically in the profession. It can be quite disturbing at times. Um, what do you, what do you think of where we are politically, and how we change that for chiropractic to have a, a future? Yeah, the the political issue is, gosh, we're divided just like we've always been. Uh, but it, the the great thing is. The, the side that I think you and I are on, you know, and I hate the sides, but there are sides. There's like right now there's this anti-X-ray movement in chiropractic and it's been going on for two decades and it's becoming quite prevalent. And there's, there's then the other side of people that are like, you know what, we use X-ray and we use it appropriately, you know, in clinical practice and we have rational and justification for it. So unfortunately, we are divided as a profession right now. And it's a huge division, and I, I don't see that really, you know, coming to you know a, a happy medium, because, for example, I'm never going to say that. Yep, I, I think that I can give up X-ray and chiropractic practice and and not treat a person properly. You know what I mean? Right. I'm, I'm just gonna if you take away my X-ray rights, I'm gonna quit. I, I, I got nothing to do because now I can't properly assess somebody and see what in the heck is really going on with their spine. All right? No surgeon, no orthopedic, no neurosurgeon would ever give up imaging, ever, right? Because they know that it, it's going to totally impair what it is that they do as, as a professional. And it's going to you know, ruin the quality of life outcomes of their patients, etc. Well, I'm the same way, and you know, apparently you are with this conversation we're having, right? Well, the the people on the other side of this, they're they're never going to concede that X-ray is okay, and they're never going to concede that X-ray is useful and improves, you know, chiropractic clinical outcomes. No matter how many randomized trials my group or, or other people do, every single one of them, even when they're high quality randomized trials with long term follow ups. They just get attacked for like political reasons and made up reasons, and you know it's one thing to a, you know to another. That they these people will never concede that X-ray is okay, and it's it, it's either an agenda or money or it's complete ignorance. I don't know which one it is, right? Yeah, and I, and I I feel that that divide is the, the there's the subluxation deniers, and then there's a whole cascade of things that go from that. And yep. then subluxation adjustment deniers, you know, we're, we're, we're basically some kind of glorified physical therapist that treat injuries versus uh, we're focusing on uh, the health of the integrity of the nervous system, spine and nerve system. And then there's the subluxation and adjustment oriented and focused. And then there's a whole cascade of things that, you know, are in each of those areas. 
uh, what I get frustrated or uh, concerned about is what I see in our schools and then what happens to the future of chiropractic and make sure as many students, because they're going to be the future, you know, you and I will be out at some point, right? And there, yep. that, that there's many of these people as possible um, that are going through the educational system now get focused on and exposed to the subluxation and adjustment when they're paying for a chiropractic education. Yep. This is a, a big issue. This is, you know, where my group, we really work to support the chiropractic colleges that want to, you know, have our work there. And so CBP technique is taught at a handful of chiropractic colleges, and those are the colleges we tend to support. You know, it's Life West and, and uh, Life University, and then a couple of them dabble in it. But, you know, for me, excuse me, it's really the two lives that really support CBP technique. So in return, we support them back. And, you know, how do we make sure the students have this in their future? Well, my, my mission is like two or threefold. The quality research that we do, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, take my hits when I put out a paper. If there's legitimate critiques, we take it to heart and we try to improve the next study that we do, right? And if they're non-legitimate critiques, then we just don't care. And most of them are non-legitimate, right? But some of them, once in, a, once in a while, you're like, well, I didn't think about that. Yeah, I got to look at that and see if that's true or not true. So we put out the research, and now it's, it's there forever. It's in PubMed. It's in the Index of Chiropractic Literature. And the savvy, interested mind, male or female, they're going to find that. And they're going to go, just like we found Alf Bregg's work, they're going to go, this is it, right? This is, this is how we do it. So I got the research. And then the other thing I've just done is, uh, is I connected with the ICA. We got, we got uh, approved for the first ever True Technique Diplomate program. And it's called the CBP Diplomate through the ICA. So we now have a 400-hour Diplomate program that's a post-grad course. And this is where, you know, uh, students can't really do it. You have to be a licensed chiropractor to actually get your Diplomate right? It's because it's post-grad, but we now have this diplomate program that is truly considered extra credentialing. So it's a, it's a higher level of education, if you will, in chiropractic. And this sets the bar a little bit higher for corrective care. In corrective care sciences, it's like, okay, <clears throat> I now have a diplomate. I have my DC, but I have my CBP diplomate as well. And that's where these uh, people, students, Doctors hopefully will find the you know the value in spine correction and subluxation assessment and long term care management when needed for people, and so I, I think when when we do that, we we leave a platform for for the future generations to then step onto that platform and go that was a pretty good start. Let's see what we can do now, right? And I, I think you know the future generation it's really important that we build these types of platforms for them. And they got to be damn strong platforms, otherwise they just fall apart, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, agree a thousand percent. And, you know, when you look at that um, and you see, what would you recommend? You've got kind of the average person walks into chiropractic school. They, they, may, not, they may have had chiropractic before. They may know nothing about it. They're a blank slate, right, to, to some degree. What would you recommend for them to, to, to go down a path I mean, regardless of their technique per se, their whatever it is they're doing, but to, to become the best chiropractor they can be. Yeah, th this is the issue, the best that they can be. And, and this is where I might, you know, irritate some of the audience listeners, <laughs> Daniel. But, you know, we're old timers and, you know, some of these young generations, we don't understand like the millennials. I don't understand the work ethic and the, the whining and the give me a handout issue. I, I can't understand that. So I've come to the conclusion that CBP technique, for example, it's not for 50% of the, the incoming students because it's not going to be what you want. It's going to make you work too hard. It, it's going to make it to where you have to drive your own bus. You have to drive the, your train. You have to pursue this. You have to study. You have to become an expert in, in the spine itself. And then you've got to be held accountable to patient outcomes based on those things. That's not for everybody. Some people like the other road. Well, the other road is fine. Just be the best you can be on, you know, if you want to do pain-based care and movement-based care and simpler types of things where you, you know, quite frankly, there's some chiropractors that 
treat everybody the same way. They say they don't, but you walk into their office, what do you see? Every, everybody gets the same exact thing. I mean, I've seen offices like that, right? Yep. They're, they're chiropractors. They're, they're doing it. Well, they're quite good at it, too. Like, I've been adjusted by some of those. And I'm like, wow, that was pretty good. You're smooth. But it's, it's simple. It's easy because everybody gets that. Mm-hmm. And there's, there's very little thought process that goes into it. If you want to do that, be the best that you can be. But if, if you want something that's like, I think, a little more profound and you go, I'm actually a doctor of chiropractic, <laughs> right? I, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a massage therapist. I am a doctor. Then you got to hold yourself accountable to that. And you hold yourself accountable to the needs of the patient that come in. And you've got to learn as much as you can about all techniques because, you know, you, you will need to rely on some of those techniques at certain times. When If you really care about the person in front of you, you're going to have to dip into your you know, clinical repertoire and go, oh, my God, this isn't working. What else do I know how to do? Mm-hmm. And you're going to try to help that person, especially if there's nowhere else for them to go, right? So you've got to get good at you know, a lot of different techniques, but you also got to get really good at understanding neurophysiology, biomechanics, and how to truly correct the spine with people. And, you, you know, this, this is a totally different game. You've, you've got to sit down and analyze a patient and not just, you know, do a half-assed exam, half-assed, you know, x-ray and don't even look at it past that. No, you've got to measure things and analyze things and correlate it to their pain, symptoms, function, and health. And then you've got to pursue proper treatment and document Right. So, I mean, these are the an incoming student. I mean, I know I'm going on, but an incoming student is faced with this, you know, which way do I go? Well, it depends on what type of person you are. Are you a worker? Do you want to figure things out or do you want the easy road? I mean, that's really what it is. You know, I think you hit on another very key phrase, which is um, you use the word accountable Uh, accountability. I think there's a lot of chiropractic practitioners that have a problem with accountability. Um, and ha- yep. I'm a big proponent in, in, you know, in the work I do to make sure people are using outcomes. They, they have an outcome, uh, outcome assessment and that you're an outcome-based approach that you're measuring progress in a wide range of indicators yep. uh, versus that, oh, I bought an instrument to measure something and then I used it at screenings and I never used it again. You know, there's no post yep. check on whatever it is. And you see that sadly all the time versus that you're actually seeing, am I getting a change in the person other than symptom relief, other than they feel a little bit better, I can move a little bit better or something like that. Yep. You nailed it. And here, this is a huge problem. Again, like you said, accountability. Problem with x-ray, you're accountable to what's on that x-ray. <laughs> I mean, you, you can't lie on a post x-ray, right? You can't right. lie. Yeah. And then... The same thing, you go around and you ask, like I do obviously teaching all over, and I, I've asked everywhere I go, here in the States and international, how many doctors actually keep valid and reliable outcome assessment questionnaires? And it's shockingly low, it's disturbingly low. Yeah. Like, you gotta at minimum have a four part numerical rating scale. You know, we're not just about symptoms, but you gotta say, hey, Daniel, you got headaches. Rate it now, rate it best, rate it worst, rate it on average. I got to know that, right? We got to document it. There's multiple reasons, you know, if somebody comes back at you afterwards and says you didn't make them better or maybe there's some kind of a board complaint or whatever it is, you got to CYA and you know what that means, right? Right. right. So, and then we have to have disability indices like the neck disability and oswestry disability. And you got to have a health status questionnaire. You got to see are we truly changing their life in, you know, true validated ways. And in the SF36 is a great tool for that, right? So the short form 36 questionnaire. So we got to have at least those and then we got to have some kind of functional movement assessment. It's got to be range of motion or you know, watch them squat and videotape it or, you know, do EMG or you got to have something, right? Mm-hmm. And then you, then you have to have posture. You have to have a postural measurement. And then in my opinion, you have to have an x-ray. And, and these are the accountability things that are minimum standard in my opinion. But, you know, for people like us, they're actually, we're above the standard, you know, just by doing those things, we're like the elite, which is crazy. And then sometimes then you're like, they're your detractors that will say, 
doing that stuff is somehow bad because you should just get rid of the person after six visits when they feel better. You know? Right. <laughs> You're doing it for money versus that you want the best outcome. And you mentioned the uh, the questionnaires. I will say um, Curtis Fedorchuk's uh, system with the health and wellness score, brilliant yep. for practitioners to use along those lines. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, Curtis and, and Doug Lightstone, they're uh, doing a great job. And, you know, selfishly for CBP, because I, I love chiropractic, but my mission is corrective chiropractic. If, if we have a thousand CBP doctors using health and wellness scores, then we can contact each and every one of them and get permission to access their data. And we can see, you know, how effective a thousand CBP doctors are at improving the health status and quality of life of people with headaches or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you, you know, it just opens up a, a huge data resource that the profession sorely needs. And, you know, also what you said about the pain stuff, here's what chiropractic and PT are doing right now. They're putting out new guidelines that say 6 to 12 visits. And if you get somebody to a 4 or a 5 out of 10 on an NRS, that's as good as they get. Th that's done. So if, if they are a, a four out of ten, that means that they're forty percent. It's they're they're done with care. You've got them better, and you're like, what? What the hell is this? You know, what about having zero or or a one out of ten, right? And th this is the craziest thing ever that they're doing to the profession. It's like, oh yeah, six visits, they're a four out of ten. Now they started at a five or a six. That you're better. Kick them out of practice. <laughs> yeah, it's so much for optimal health and wellness. Right. <laughs> right, and and this is where the health and wellness score comes in because I'm sure you've you've used the scale. I mean, there's eight subscales, and it breaks down into the four main categories: physical, pain, emotional, and social. And so when you cover you know those four realms on people, then you can actually see that hey, maybe their pain maybe it doesn't improve, but their psychosocial emotional well being is really improving. Mm -hmm. It's going way above population norms. So they weren't done with care, right? Right, right. And and you know, when you I the whole med, med, maximum medical improvement thing, I've seen people that their health and wellness score, their their quality of life continues to improve long after that. I've seen that their second, third round of x-rays continue to improve compared to what I saw in the first six months or something like that. And, yep. and, and then it just irks me. Oh, yeah, get rid of them after 12 visits. That's right. That's wise. Yep. And, <laughs> and this is this is where the clinicians, anybody listening to this out there, if you're not doing these pain and disability and health you know, questionnaires, you got to start now. And they're done at every every single evaluation you have to right yeah. and it it is accountability right but it also it protects you as the doctor so many times i've seen doctors that didn't do those that are like oh my god now what do i do and I'm like yeah now what do you do is you got to go back to your you know chicken scratch notes that you did <laughs> and it's it's crazy well you know i tell people all the time outcome assessments and there's a range of them people have the ones that they like for their approach, but health outcome assessments are going to what make separate you as being a doctor taking care of someone versus like you're a Ralph or, or a massage therapist or something like that. Not that there's anything wrong with those healing arts by any means, but you're a doctor of chiropractic, practice like one and, and, and assess the person and then reassess that you're actually making a change in their overall health status and subjectively and objectively. That's right. Hey, uh, can I throw out a, a yeah. new research study that I'm Please sure do. that yeah, you... Yeah you know all the listeners would probably like and I'm just looking at it on my big computer screen so if you would notice my eyes go over <laughs> it's my my memory is not as good as it used to be Yours but in the, yeah <laughs> the, this is uh, this is not a study that I did but I just look for other things out there and uh, this one came out in 2017 it's from uh, the journal of the uh, Korean Neurosurgical Asso uh, Society which is it's a PubMed journal it's a professional uh, orthopedic journal. And here, here's the title of the paper. Prognostic Factor Analysis for Management of Chronic Neck Pain. Can we predict the severity of neck pain with a lateral cervical curvature? And here, here's what they, they identified is they, they showed in, and it, it's a retrospective review, but it's a consecutive series. So they ended up with uh, <clears throat> a few hundred subjects 
and these are pain management docs. And here's what they did. They, they looked at when we administer pain management, some people get better and some people don't. It, which is, you know, obviously that's what happens in chiropractic practice too. You administer a chiropractic adjustment, some people get better, some people don't. Well, what what they identified is the the straightened and the kyphotic and the S curve necks didn't respond to, to medication. Hmm. And so basically, they said the the chronic neck pain and the severe neck pain was unresponsive to medication, and it was linked to the shape of the neck curve. That's and, interesting. It's very cool. It came out in uh, 2017, July, uh, volume 60, number four. And the lead author, I'll butcher the name, so I'll just spell it as S-E-O-N-G, initials H-Y. And you just look it up on PubMed, and it, it just it says, we should keep in mind, conclusion, that it may be difficult to manage patients with straight, kyphotic, and sigmoid lateral curvatures with oral medication. And, uh, you, you look at this... You look at this as chiropractors, you go, yeah, sorry, I got to, I, I try not to swear to anybody. You go, no shit. No, you, you can't manage a structural problem with pharmacology. And, you know, the other thing is for chiropractors out there, if it's a structural problem, you can't just do functional things to it and expect it to get better. It's not just, oh, I improved the motion, so they're better. No, you know what's going to happen? The pain's going to come back if you don't change the neck curve, the low back curve, or the thoracic curve. And, you know, finally, we're starting to see medical literature and orthopedic literature catch up to what corrective chiropractors have been spouting off for, you know, several decades. But it's neat to see these types of papers coming out. And, you and know? I think it also goes back to just the concept, does ad, do you see signs and indicators on outcomes that adverse mechanical cord tension has eased from the system. Um, and that chiropractors don't even learn that term. I, 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 find, I find them all the time. They've never even heard the term. Right, <laughs> right. And, you know, there's some great, you know, research on that with, uh, you know, I don't know if you've read Butler's book. So Dave, David S. No. Butler. It, he, it was an offshoot of uh, Bragg's work. It was in the uh, early 1990s. And his his work was basically where you know neural flossing came came uh, to be. Butler called his book "Mobilization of the Central Nervous System," and you know he was a PT looking at Alf Bragg's book, looking at signs and symptoms of neural tensioning. And Butler's book, I read it as a student just because I was fascinated in it. And I want to say it was a 1992 book, but it could be 1994. It's been a while since I read it. There's the memory again. But but uh, you know. A, a great book on you know tension in the central nervous system with movement based analysis right right and you know positioning of extremities positioning of the spine looking for neural tensioning type of things and and uh, the audience out there probably should look that up David Butler mobilization of the nervous system I'll put it in the I'll put it in the show notes along with the links to CBP nonprofit and and uh, health and wellness score and the chiropractic biophysics biophysics techniques and seminars I'll put that in there as well so people can find that um, you know I, I want to thank you for your time for I know you're a busy guy uh, and to take your take your time out to be on the podcast and I, and I I truly feel like we we've seen a lot of things in chiropractic and we're like at a point where the, the subluxation adjustment focused practitioners, you know, have to, if chiropractic is going to survive in its future and be called chiropractic, um, have to somehow, you know, be able to work together and prov provide science, research, and look at each other's things, and, and it's vital. So I appreciate the, what you've done for chiropractic has been phenomenal and what you continue to do. And I, I again, want to acknowledge you for that. Um, and everybody listening, uh, share this episode, um, subscribe to the podcast. We have a number of great episodes coming up. Um, and join us at Mile High, August 16th to 19th. Uh, www.milehighchiro.org. It's an incredible home uh, for philosophy, science, and art for practitioners that you know are focused on subluxation adjustment being the center, you know, centerpiece of their practice. So, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dean Harrison, and I appreciate all you do for chiropractic. Oh, you're welcome. It was an honor and a privilege, and I had a great time, Daniel. Thank you. <laughs>